So I was eavesdropping a little bit um, and sounded like you guys were having some good discussions. I heard discussions about the types of people you have difficulty interacting with. And, and from what I could hear, um, some of it had to do with some of those more extreme types, right? Like some an extreme red or an extreme blue. Um, so anyway, I hope you found that useful. We're not gonna really debrief on this because I like to save our time for some additional conversation, but hopefully you at least got a, got a chance to get to know each other and identify again, maybe some similarities that you didn't identify initially when you went into your, um, into your brainstorming um, icebreaker. Oh, uh, oh, Lily, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's one question that came in right at the end of the main, last main session, which we didn't address, which is, is there a correlation in kind of attribute and kind of job, like more reds usually in research? One more time, what's the last part of that? Like, like having more reds in research. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, when I was going over the slides, I know I went pretty quickly in the beginning. I mean, people who tend to be higher in kind of the analytic, um, the analytic or autonomizing types do tend to be in occupations or jobs like engineering, um, hard science, very um, more solitary. Some academic kinds of jobs, of course, there's a lot of differences across academic disciplines. Um, so yes, it, absolutely. So it correlates with your occupational choice. It influences um, how you fit in with a particular organizational context. And it also influences how you fit with a particular job within an occupation and within an organizational com context. So one thing that we study in organizational psychology, I mentioned it is fit. And so we can think about it in terms of how much do you person organization fit person occupation fit, person job fit, and there's actually something called person team fit. So there's these different layers of fit um, that can be in alignment or unalignment, but we know that perceptions of fit on the part of the individual is related to things like how satisfied you are, how committed you are to the work you do, your likelihood of exiting the organization or the job or the occupation. So does that answer the question or anything else before we move on? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Great. Um, okay, so we've been talking exclusively to right now about how you are motivated when everything's going well. But as we know, that's not always the case. And so now we are going to switch gears and look at your behavior when in conflict. Okay, so conflict can come in lots of different forms. Right, so conflict can be kind of more substantive or task related, like you just have a different, a different idea about how you should approach a task on a team project than a colleague, or conflict can be more relational or interpersonal. And so when we talk about your behavior in conflict, we're really talking about both types of conflict. But what we do know is that relational conflict, more interpersonal aspects of conflict tend to be the most, tend to be more stressful and detrimental sometimes having conflict about kind of substantive issues can actually increase performance, right? If you consider alternative perspectives and you're able to come up with a better solution, as long as you don't have that relational conflict. So you've got, you've got two things going on. You've got situations that change. So sometimes a situation is, conf is, is absent conflict and sometimes a situation involves conflict. But then you also may see differences in what motivates people under these two circumstances, right? So you've got kind of these two things going on, kind of the situational context, but also from an individual difference perspective, some people, when everything's going well, is motivated, are motivated by one thing, but when in conflict, really their personality or their, the way they manifest their strengths can really be different. And so that's where we're going right now. And we're gonna use the same instrument. And so if you remember when you filled this out, you asked a, were asked a series of questions when everything's going well, and then you answered a series of questions when you were in, how would you normally react, respond or react when everyone in conflict? So we're gonna use the same system. We're not gonna go through all these types again. I think you guys have your, hopefully have your head around that. But some people when in conflict are motivated to accommodate. Some people when in conflict are motivated to assert themselves. Some are motivated to step back and be logical and analyze the situation. And some people are motivated by using multiple styles. So for example, let's say that you're, you're really um, 
accommodating or, or you're motivated by these nurturing motivations when everything's going well. But when in conflict, maybe you're motivated to kind of take a step back and really look at the big picture and get all the details first and be very logical in coming up with a solution to a problem. So that would be a switch from being blue when everything's good to being green when in conflict. Okay. So what we're going to see is that some of you will be very similar. Some of you will change dramatically based on your results, at least predicted to change dramatically. So what I want you to do now is go to page 10 of your report. And I am going to be using a few different examples. So you're going to see the examples change. So don't let that throw you. And I'd like you to look at the bottom part of the triangle where you see this box that says conflict sequence. And what you're going to see is you're going to see three different scores, just like we saw below uh, earlier. And the highest score is going to be your preferred mode of handling conflict. The next score, the next highest would be your next preferred and then your third preferred. And then you'll see a conflict sequence here. Now you may see brackets. So you may see brackets around all three, which means that you're in that center hub, or you may see brackets around just two of these. So you might start with a preference to red, and then you might see brackets around green, blue. Again, that just means that when you see brackets, those two scores are not statistically different from each other. So there will be a lot of different combinations. So take a second and read this brief description on page 10, and maybe if some of you can give a quick thumbs up when you're done, I'll know when most of the group is ready. And you don't have to worry too much about interpreting your line and all that. Just try to kind of wrap your head around primarily the how you experience conflict and then kind of understanding your results. We'll talk more about the line and the arrow in a minute. Got a couple of people who are done. Okay. <coughs> getting quite a few thumbs up now okay great um so i will one thing that can throw people sometimes is if you do have a bracket around two or all three of the colors you might say well i have a bracket around red and blue but my blue is actually higher than my red, but it lists red first. It doesn't really matter. These results are not statistically different. So just to not have an infinite number of possibilities, if it's bracketed, assume that your scores are not practically or statistically different from each other, okay? So sometimes that can throw people. So again, we've forgotten about how you are when everything is going well. Now this is how you are in conflict. So what you hopefully have a sense of now is how much you, whether you change, right? So are you a, a blue red when everything's going well and do you go green when in conflict and that's your preferred strategy that's just an example so we're going to look at our um, conflict sequence again and in this example here this person is a true blend because their scores are highly highly similar and you can see all three scores are in brackets Okay, and here's an example where the red score is actually a 32 and the green score is a 34, but if the person is considered a blue, red, green, just for cataloging purposes. So your highest number is your preferred style, and you might have two numbers that are your preferred if the first two um, colors are in brackets. And again, that means that you can easily operate between those two styles as a first strategy. Okay, so again, how do you deploy your strengths? Now we're talking about how do you deploy your strengths when in conflict? 
So questions about interpreting that part. That was a lot quicker, but I figured you had kind of the background. But questions about, we're going to talk about the arrow. We're going to talk about the length of the arrow in a minute, but just those styles and what those results mean. Go ahead and unmute yourself now if you have questions. Okay, so let's look at all of you guys when in conflict. So we saw a class profile when everything was going well. And if I'm correct, about a quarter were red and a quarter were in the hub. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So now we're just looking at how you are when in conflict. And it's pretty different, right? So now we have the preferred conflict style and two thirds of you go green. In other words, when in conflict, whatever your original motivating system was, you tend to pull back. You want to be more logical, methodical, thoughtful. And it's interesting um, that we, the, it, the percentages I just think is interesting. We do have some folks that, that become more nurturing or maybe not more nurturing, are motivated to help and nurture when in conflict. And then we also have some blends. We, have, we don't have anyone that goes to, a, uh, goes to solely a directive, assertive style when in conflict. So this green, my guess, I mean, I'm a psychologist. I haven't done a full assessment on all of you, but I think this does reflect in some respect some similarity among the group in terms of being academics and being in translational science. Um, it's interesting that we didn't have as many greens um, as, your, as your overall motivational system. But again, you guys are doing lots of different work in lots of different contexts. Some of you are basic scientists. Some of you are doing much more implementation or intervention science. Um, but it's interesting that many of you are, um, are green when in conflict. So let's talk a little bit about what this means, right? So I've kind of been talking about it like you're one way when in con when everything's going well and you're another way when in conflict, but it's actually a, a quite a bit more nuanced. So on page 10, um, and you probably already looked at this to some extent. Um, hmm, I think this is actually a duplicate page, I'm sorry. Because I think you guys already looked at how you deploy your strengths, maybe I hit the wrong thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how much you change and what the arrow actually means. So we know how you are when everything's going well. We know how this predicts you'll be in conflict. But then the question becomes, how much do you change and in what direction? And this really gets to the idea of the strength deployment in the context of different kinds of situations that you might experience. And so one thing to notice is the direction of the arrow. Okay, so your own personal arrow. It has a starting point, which is where the dot was when we first did the debrief. That's also here. This person was red because their originating point was more in the red. And then their arrow is going down to green, right? So this means that when everything's going well, well, they tend to be not, very, not really super strong because they're, they're not way up in this part of the quadrant, but they tend to be asserting be more motivated by being in charge, asserting themselves, directing others. And then in conflict though, they move much more toward stepping back, being methodical, analyzing the situation before they act. And in fact, their green score when in conflict is, is much lower than their red score when in conflict. So what this means is that when someone deploys their strengths, when this particular person deploys their strength, their first and most comfortable strategy is gonna be green, methodical, look at all the facts, don't make a rash decision, really think through it, make sure they're considering all the alternatives. If that doesn't work, their next approach would be to be more assertive and directing. And then if that, if that bombs miserably, their least preferred strategy would be to be more helpful and understanding and try to uh, be a little bit more um, oriented toward others when solving conflict. Okay, so the direction of the arrow tells you how much your behavior changes and where it's going, right? Um, and there, 
what to consider are these kind of like neighboring conflict regions mean that, you know, this person is moving toward green, but they're still closer to red than they are blue. And we can see that in their scores, right? So this tells us pretty certainly that the least preferred strategy for this individual is going to be being nurturing and oriented toward others when in conflict. That's gonna be the least preferred. Not that they can't do it, just gonna be the least preferred. So I'd like you to take a minute and read this summary on page 10 about when faced with conflict, how you experience conflict based on your style. So these are all customized to your individual findings. And then give me a thumbs up when you're, when you're close or done. So again, if you guys give me a thumbs up when you're when you're done, that'd be great. Seeing one so far. Okay. Couple. We're getting some now. Okay. Okay, I think you're good to go. Okay. So on page 13, I'm not going to have you read this, but I'll I'll um, I'll encourage you to look at it. It's just a very brief summary. It's just, again, a description of your, of your particular conflict sequence style and just a really quick kind of 30,000 foot how you would be likely to deploy your strengths. And this is an example of a, of a green, red, blue conflict sequence. So one thing that we know is that your scores might be really different when everything's going well and when, when in conflict, but they might not. And so what we're gonna see in just a second is that the longer the arrow is, the greater the change. So here's just some rules of thumb and I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute. So you, you probably, hopefully you can see it in your actual results. It's gonna be hard to see on my um, PowerPoint, but the triangle is set up on a grid system and so if your arrow crosses more under 12 points from where it originates to where the arrowhead is, you don't change much when in conflict. Um, if, it, if it's between 15 and 25, your behavior changes somewhat. And if the arrow is over 25 points, you act really differently when in conflict. So I'm just gonna give you an example of three different people here. So we can see this first person who's in the red quadrant, very little change. So this person is assertive directing and they're assertive directing. Doesn't matter if they're in conflict, doesn't matter if things are going well. The second person is about medium change. So they, they tend to be assertive nurturing, but a little bit more on the assertive side, excuse me, a little bit more on the nurturing side when things are going well. And they move toward more of an assertive um, orientation to nurturing when things are going not so well. And then this third person changes a lot, right? They go from being very altruistic and nurturing when everything's going well and pulling back and being much more analytical when in conflict. So you wanna look at two things. You wanna look at the length of the arrow and you wanna look at which way it's heading. So any of these arrows could be placed anywhere. So you could have someone that starts in the hub and stays in the hub, right? You could have someone that you know, starts in green and moves to blue. So this is just, these are really just for illustration purposes. And, you know, people often ask me when I do this live, like, well, is it better to change a lot or is it better to stay the same? And there's really no answer. What it means is if, if you don't change much when in conflict compared to when things are going well, you might, people don't know that conflict is coming, right? 
And if you are a certain style, like if you tend to be blue to start with and you stay blue when in conflict, you're not probably not sending any signals that there's interpersonal tension, which can actually be bad in the long haul in terms of managing relationships effectively. On the other hand, if you change a lot in conflict, that can lead people to be very taken aback when, you're in, when they're in a conflict situation with you and, and seem to think that you're acting really differently, which can create additional tension, right? So there's no one right answer in terms of, is it better to be this or is it better to be that? A lot of times I'll have people say, well, I just wish I was in the hub so I could use all of these strategies all the time. And there are advantages to being in the hub, but the, in the hub, again, is this middle part. This is the blue, red, green part. There are some advantages, but actually one of the common criticisms um, that people have if, of people they interact with in the hub is that they're very hard to read. And sometimes they're viewed as kind of not wishy-washy, but not really sure where they stand on things because they can change their orientation so uh, fluidly. So the, all of these styles have pluses and minuses and it just, you are where you are, but if, you, if, if there were a place where you, if you're like, gosh, I, I really don't want to become, be so nurturing when in conflict, I'd really like to learn to be more assertive when in conflict, then that's something you can take away as a piece of personal self-development and then you could talk to me or you could talk to, somebody else who, um, who you trust that has some insight and get some advice about how you start developing those skills, kind of in safe situations to start with until you can practice them and get some feedback. But I've done a lot of executive ed work over the years as well, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you guys offline, um, you know, over email or phone. If there's, if there's any areas that you really wanna work on, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to spend some time with you. So this is, this. now you can see why this gives you a kind of a much more comprehensive, it's not saying you're always introverted or you're, you know, you're always agreeable. Um, it's saying, well, this is what motivates you when things are going well, but you know what, when things are in conflict, you might actually be motivated by very different things. So it's not just the length of the arrow, it's also the direction it's headed that gives you insight into your own style of relating in these two different contexts. So here's the class profile. So nobody is identified here, but this shouldn't surprise you because remember 61% of the class is green when in conflict, right? So here are the individual people, this person G, they start blue and they move green, right? Um, quite a few of you are starting in the hub and this is what we saw with the 25 or 26% that, um, that were in the hub to start with. Some of you started off in the red but all of you are moving toward kind of your, your spot of like, I'm gonna sit back, I'm gonna look at details, I'm gonna be methodical, I'm gonna analyze the situation when in conflict. Now, some of you are really doing this, whoever this person is, that is really a strong preference for being methodical. Some of you are moving toward green, but you know, you've still got a lot of blue. Some of you are moving toward green, but you're still in the red, right? So just remember that this is a lot of diversity within the class, even though you guys are generally, you know, two thirds of you are moving in the same direction. So I'll give you a second. Are there any questions about the conflict sequence or your scores or how to interpret? You can unmute yourself if you have a question. <coughs> I have a question. Are we going to retake the test, if I could say, at the end of this uh, mentor year? I mean, maybe there will be some change based on what we have learned. Yeah, that's a great question, Alexander. Um, we don't have that built in to the, um, we don't have it built into the, uh, the class itself. And I don't know... I think someone would have to really be working specifically with their mentor to try to affect change in one of these areas. I would not anticipate seeing great change just by participating in the program, um, but it's possible, right? I think it'd be more likely if you, had, um, if you had joined a program that was specifically designed to learn skills to be a more supportive um, leader or manager, right? Or if you had joined a program to try to um, you know, reduce some of your assertive tendencies. Um, the assessment is actually not that expensive per person. Um, so it's conceivable that if someone was really interested and they reached out to me, I'd have to talk to Lauren about how that works. But 
um, it's not something you can just go on online and do. Like I have to order it because I'm a psychologist and yada, yada, yada. But if someone was really interested, there may be a way, I don't remember how much the assessments were, but I don't think they're terribly expensive. One thing that they have, which is pretty interesting, is they do have a version where somebody else fills it out on you. So um, you could have a, you know, you could have a colleague or a spouse or your manager fill this out, and then you can get a report where you can see how others see you and how you see yourself, and that can actually be really insightful too. So this instrument's actually used in a lot of different ways. So I don't know if I answered your question, but feel free to follow up um, by email with me if you'd like. But I would not anticipate you'd see enormous differences in a pretty brief uh, participation in the program. Okay, thank you. But I will keep in mind the fact that maybe uh, a mentor, for example, uh, like um, a PI that uh, I work with could, you know, fill that up also. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple more questions. Lara? Hi, uh, this is Lara. Um, I was very surprised that there was uh, no shift towards blue uh, when in conflict. Because, um, I mean, from the way that I understood it, it looked like blue was more collaborative and, uh, you know, more like a, an environment where you would um, resolve conflict if it arose. Mm -hmm. You mean no shift in the, are you talking about the class profile or are you talking about your individual scores, Laura? Um, no, like in general, um, the, the, the general class profile, it seems like we're all shifting towards analytical rather than yeah. collaborative. Yeah. But remember, this is when in conflict, right? And so I think, you know, this is why, you know, your point is well taken. I mean, some people do end up collaborating. This doesn't mean you can't collaborate. It just means your initial approach is to step back and put on your scientist hat, which all of you are, right? and think through the situation and analyze, et cetera. Um, some of you down here who are very green are actually not that comfortable using the more blue approach, right? And actually the blue approach is not so much collaborative, it's more accommodating. So people who tend to be really strong in blue when in conflict, they give in to others. Ah, uh, okay. That, and that actually was... that kind of, that, that especially for women, I find that concerning because it's very stereotypical, right? Um, so what's what actually collaborative are people is more in the hub. People who can use a variety of different tactics, they can be a little assertive, they can also look at the facts, they can try to bring other people in. Okay. So this is much more the accommodating style, which can be really helpful in some situations, which hopefully we'll get a chance to get to. Like if the, if, the, if the relationship is really, really important, you don't want people to be forcing their way. You don't want these uh, super aggressive response. People need to care, right? People need to use some of these accommodating styles, but people who are really accommodating can also be taken advantage of in terms of their, um, their own needs in a complex situation. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I, th I sure. think I understood, thank you. That also answered the other question oh, that was in okay. the chat box. Okay, great. So anybody else have questions? <coughs> okay. Um, so let's just put it all together, a few summary slides, and we're going to talk a little bit more about conflict management in particular. Um, so just remember, there's an infinite number of possibilities. So one thing I, I'm always concerned about with personality type inventories is putting people in boxes. And so even if the, somebody is a red green and another person is a red green, you could be a lot of different places on this, um, on this grid and still be red green. So just remember, there's a lot of differences. There's a lot, infinite number of combinations. But this also means that there's potential challenges in relating to people, especially people who are very different from you. And one of the, one of, when I asked you to think about the type of people you have difficulty relating to, what I often hear when we do this in real time is that, it's really the extremes that people often talk about. So an extreme red, who's just my way or the highway, right? An extreme blue, who's just gonna give in and accommodate and not, not fight. Or sometimes an extreme green, who may be viewed as detached and not taking the situation as urgently 
by their desire to kind of sit back and use all the information. So most of you are somewhere not in these extreme points, and that's good news. It means that there's some flexibility, and it's not to say if you were extreme that it's a, it's a fatal personality flaw. It just means that people may have a more difficult understa time understanding you the more extreme you are, either when everything's going well or when in conflict, because you're more likely to have very, a very strong orientation and be different from people. Okay, so when you think about relating with others, it's important to consider your own motivational system, but also to try to do some armchair psychology. And by the way, Eric Lawrence is not in our class. Um, to do some armchair psychology to figure out what is it about this department head that I really have trouble relating to, or what is it about this collaborator who I thought was going to be great and we have really complementary. Um, we have really complementary research areas, but you just don't seem to get along and you ha and have some interpersonal conflict. Thinking about these different um, styles can be really helpful. This is also sometimes used in team environments, not surprisingly, where you can plot everyone on the team and then um, kind of like what I did for your, for your exercise, but like an intact team. So it could be used for an intact research team as well. So I just, you know, kind of as a, as a point of reflection, just thinking about the type of people you have trouble relating to, and then also helping, thinking about how can you help people better understand what motivates you and how what motivates you might be different from what motivates other people. So I would encourage you to, you know, delve further into this assessment, not today, you know, anytime over the course of the, of the program or later, it's yours to keep. Um, you can read about your own motivational style in more detail. You can read about your conflict style, but you can also read about the strengths of the different styles of relating. So not just your own strength, if you're a blue green or a red blue, but other types of strengths. And I think this overdone strengths is really, really helpful because this helps you understand how what, what is a strength for you could be viewed negatively or could be viewed as a potential liability, particularly if your scores are extreme um, by others. So there's just some future reading for you on that. So hopefully this gives you a you know, quick but better understanding of what motivates your behavior and how you might be viewed by other people. Uh, we hope it gives you some sense of what makes you different and unique, but also how you can appreciate differences in others. Um, and some strategies to use when interacting. So reflecting on your own motives, um, modifying your behavior, maybe to appeal to other people's motives. So if you're interacting with someone, particularly someone who's in a position of authority over you, and you know that they're very um, analytical, and maybe that's some, a strength you can play to them, particularly when in conflict. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, to help you be aware of and leverage your strengths, but also be aware of um, potential overdone strengths. So we've got about 15 minutes, um, and I like to include a little bit more on the practical side, right? So this has been a lot of introspection and self-awareness and, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully getting to know your colleagues, but I want to give you some more kind of concrete takeaways. So as I mentioned earlier on, <coughs> excuse me, even though we might have a preference for green, for example, like many of you go green, if you will, when in conflict and you want to be methodical and analyze, um, that may not be appropriate in every situation. So conflict situations can vary in their appropriateness. I mean, sorry, conflict strategies can vary in their appropriateness for a situation. So I'm not going to have you do this because I don't think we have time. So we're not going to put you back in your learning communities, but we are going to um, have you quickly do this assessment. So this is an email that Lauren sent, 20 questions. I'd like you to answer it honestly, not how you want to be, but how you are. And you have to do a little math here. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to fill this out using a one to five scale, and then you're going to transpose your scores here. So item one, you're going to put here, item six, and then you're going to just subscale. And then you're going to report here your highest score. And if there are two that are tied, you can put them both there and then your next highest. So I will give you a few minutes to do some math and please give me a thumbs up when you're done.
<coughs> Kathy, if you can let me know when you start seeing hands, that'd be great. Hey, right, very well. I haven't seen any yet. So our first hand. Okay. We have two now. to four. Starting to see starting to see more hands now. Okay. I think you can probably go ahead, Lillian. Okay. Um, I just realized, this is the problem of doing things on Zoom. Um, I just realized that I, because I do this in person, I do not have the key in my PowerPoint, which is kind of a problem. Um, but I can certainly tell you, let me just look at the items. I'm sorry about that, guys. This is one of the downsides. I was just just realized it and was looking to see. Let me just make sure it's not in this. Oh, it is. Excuse me. I must just be not paying enough attention. Sorry. Um, okay. 
So what you can see here, I was looking for the key, but here's, here's the information. I'm just not used to doing this online. So here, here are the different, the five different types of um, strategies for managing conflict. They do kind of map onto the SDI, but not exactly. So the question earlier about a blue type being more collaborative, that doesn't really map on here, but it's just another way to give you a sense of what kind of actual behaviors do you prefer when in conflict? So less of a, less of a personality measure and more of a behavioral intentions type measure. And so you should have one or maybe multiple things in terms of your highest score and then one or multiple things in terms of your second highest. If you end up finding a lot of your scores really similar, it means you probably use a variety of different styles and you probably are more in that kind of flexible, cohering hub of the SDI right there in the middle. So these different approaches are forcing, which is similar to the assertive directing personality type or style of conflict management, accommodating, which is more the true blue kind of nurturing type. Avoidance, which I put in green. Um, people who tend to be green and, and sit back and look at a situation very carefully, they aren't necessarily intentionally avoiding, but they are often viewed by others as avoiding a situation. Although there are people who do truly like to avoid conflict. A compromising style, which is more of a mix of a blue-green, so it has kind of the, the nurturing and orientation of toward others, plus the ability to sit back and analyze the situation. And the collaborative type, which tends to be more of a mix of the mix of the three types. So the avoiding type in this particular assessment is the one that's probably does not map as well onto the SDI because the green type in the SDI, the methodical analytical, is not necessarily avoiding. The inventory you took did ask questions that map onto avoiding conflict. And what I have found in using this instrument for a long time is that a lot of people are very conflict avoidant. That's why we often cover these strategies when we do training for interpersonal skills. And one of the reasons people are conflict avoidant is, comes from how conflict was handled when you were growing up. So oftentimes people will talk about how in their family, you know, there was never anything wrong. We weren't supposed to voice any concerns or problems. We keep our business to ourselves. So often those strategies toward avoidance can come from a very early age. Uh, plus, a, plus confronting conflict can be very difficult for people. That's probably one of the most difficult skills to learn. So the more blended you are, in terms of your, um, how you filled out that inventory and the closer your scores are, or if you have multiple strategies that you are comfortable using or more or less more likely to use, the more easily you can adopt different strategies for different kinds of situations. So that's a pretty straightforward assessment, but I do wanna make sure there's no questions on that particularly around the avoidant type versus the green style and the SDI. And you can just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Megan, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so um, I was just wondering if maybe the, the, uh, the overlap between avoiding and analytical might also be the case that, that you're analyzing whether or not it's worth it to engage or analyzing whether or not you're you want you want to go further with another strategy, but that you pull back and sort of analyze like, okay, should I just, you know, actually engage in conflict or should I give in or should I analyze this further? But that's like part of the avoidance process is pulling back and assessing the, you know, how many, how many chips you have in the game essentially. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. And I think that that is captured in the SDI. I think it's less well captured in the little assessment you took because most of the items in the assessment you took that tap into this avoidance type are more kind of, you just don't wanna go there, right? Um, so they don't map on directly, but you're absolutely right. And I think the other thing gets at how you're perceived by others. So if you tend to go green when in conflict and you're interacting with someone who's red, very assertive and directive, your natural tendency to pull back and analyze could be interpreted as avoidance, right? Even though it's not intended. 
And that's why looking at kind of some of those overdone strengths is kind of helpful. Um, not that it is an overdone strength, but that how you're perceived by others is also based on the lens by which they use to view you, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. So in deciding, so now you have a lot of information, right? You have your conflict management sequence, you have a sense of your specific behavioral strategy preferences when managing conflict, but it's not so easy. It's not like there's one best way to go. And so as you're thinking about the best way to manage a particular conflict situation, there's really four things to keep in mind. And this is kind of like a cheat sheet. Like if you could just stop time and pull out this cheat sheet and look at these four things, you really would make a pretty good choice about how to best handle something. The first two, I think in many ways are the most important. So the first is thinking about how important the issue is, like what is the issue that you're in conflict about? And then thinking how, how important is this particular relationship to me? either in terms of like your sense of, um, of, of um, attachment to the person or your sense of dependence on the person, which may not be the same thing, right? So think of, a, think of um, somebody you report to at the university. Um, that, that relationship's really important if you wanna stay at that university and if you wanna get promotion and tenure, uh, even though you may not feel a sense of attachment to that person, right? So how important is relationship? So it is also important to think about your relative power. So if you're in a conflict situation with someone that you have power over, like a, a postdoc or a graduate student, uh, or a full-time employee on a grant that you have, you have a little more latitude about what, what kind of strategies you could use, not that, they're all, not that they're all recommended. If you don't have as much power, you need to think carefully about which strategies could be detrimental to you. And then how much time do you have to solve the problem? So if we just put this, this is your little cheat sheet, if we just put this in some sort of a, a handy dandy grid, we could think about those five different styles, forcing, accommodating, avoiding, compromise, collaborate. And we could think about these different dimensions of the situation, a particular conflict situation. And really here's what it boils down to. If the issue that you're in conflict about is important, but the relationship is not that important, <clears throat> then using a more forceful or assertive approach is arguably the best strategy, particularly if you're not vulnerable and have low power, right? And also particularly if you have to make a decision pretty quickly. So sometimes you have to make a decision quickly and you don't have time for some of these strategies like collaborating, which takes an or can take an inordinate amount of time. So if the issue is important, but the relationship's not, and you have a little more relative power than the person you're in conflict with, forcing can be an appropriate strategy. Kind of the opposite here. If the issue is not important, but the relationship is, this is when using an accommodating approach, the kind of the more giving in type of approach can be useful to maintain the relationship, particularly if the issue in question is not important. Accommodating is, can be a very effective strategy if either you have more power, which shows that you have some humility as a, as a leader or a supervisor, or if you have less power. And it also is an approach that you typically would use if you've got to make a decision relatively quickly or you've got to resolve something relatively quickly. So sometimes people think that accommodating is, you know, kind of giving in or being a doormat, but actually accommodating is a really in my opinion, it's a really effective strategy, particularly if you are a leader, to show that you can give in on some issues that may not be incredibly important, but demonstrate your commitment to the relationship. There's a time to use avoidance too, and this is when the issue and the relationship really doesn't matter. It's better probably just to not engage. Um, this also is a relatively expeditious approach, and I'm using avoiding not to be confused with this analytic autonomizing, I'm saying you're just not gonna go there. Like, there is no problem, I'm not gonna engage. That's what I mean by avoidance. This is, this is better if you're like in a peer-to-peer -peer or you have relative power over the other person because you don't wanna avoid conflict, you don't wanna avoid a potential conflict situation with someone you report to if they wanna deal with the conflict, right? Under those circumstances, you're gonna have to figure out which one of these other approaches is the most is the most valuable based on these other characteristics. 
So compromising is kind of re reaching that kind of, uh, you know, you, you give some, I give some kind of a, doesn't have to be a half-baked solution, but it's typically going to be more of an, more of a solution that is maybe not the absolute best one because each person's going to give and take. And you would use this if, you know, it's a moderately important issue and the relationship matters. You don't want to alienate someone, but you also don't want to um, maybe, maybe accommodating. You, you've got some skin in the game because the issue is important, so you don't want to completely accommodate. Um, again, this is particularly useful for a peer-to-peer -peer or if you have relative power. And this approach does take time, right? So compromising because it involves some back, or forth, back and forth may not make as much sense if you're on a time crunch. And then the final one, which people always think is like the best, is really not the best if you have to make an expeditious decision. So if you're under serious time constraints, collaborating is great if the issue is important and if the relationship is important. It can be used if you are in a subordinate, equal, or higher position, but it takes a long time. So people often ask me, well, so does that mean you never collaborate? Well, of course it doesn't mean that. What it means is sometimes you have to break down a problem into some component parts and maybe engage in a little bit of forcing or accommodation to get through some initial hurdles and then come back to collaboration as a long-term as a long-term solution or as a long-term approach to problem solving. So even though it's complicated and you've got all these different things to consider, really again, if the issue is important and the relationship isn't, if the issue is not important and the relationship is, accommodate. If neither really matter, maybe you consider whether engaging is even appropriate. If it's kind of a eh, so-so on the issues, so-so on the relationship, maybe there can be some compromising and you can get through the, you can get through the problem solving and then save collaboration when it's a really important issue, a really important relationship, and you have the time to do it. I know we're three minutes over, but we're actually almost at the very end. So there is no one best way to manage conflict. And so I'll just say that straight up. Um, you really do need to consider the situation and the factors that, that could influence the effectiveness of different strategies. Um, this is just a summary of what I just suggested and thinking about maybe taking some sequential approaches where you maybe accommodate early on just to get through a hurdle, then you come back and revisit the issue and use more of a collaborative approach if, if, it's, if the longer term uh, underlying issue is something that really matters and the relationship really matters. Um, I'd also encourage you, if there's a style that you just don't feel comfortable using, like maybe you don't feel comfortable using an accommodating style because you feel like it makes you feel weak, or you don't like using an assertive style because you don't want to be viewed in a negative way due to being a little more aggressive, I would just encourage you to think about, are there situations where you can practice those least preferred styles that aren't risky? So even if it's with friends or family members or um, colleagues that you trust, or maybe getting feedback from people who are watching you in a meeting, for example, like a friend who might be a colleague in a meeting and say, you know, I'm really trying to work on my listening ability and I tend to be very assertive and jump in and cut people off and, and really forceful. Can you just, I'm really going to try to tamp that down a little bit and be a little bit more compromising or be a little bit more collaborative. You, getting peer feedback is a great strategy. You could even do that in your learning communities if you found someone that you felt comfortable enough getting that feedback with. Because these behaviors manifest even if you're not in a straight up conflict situation. Um, so I don't know that we really have time for more questions, but I do want to tell you that you're welcome to follow up with me. Um, here's my email. You'll be seeing me again for the one-on-one -on -one session where I'll give you kind of the overview of that part of the program. Um, you can follow up with me by email. We can set up a time to talk on the phone. If you have any questions about the SDI, I really want, please don't hesitate to reach me uh, and I can, I can have a one-off with you and make sure that you understand your results. Um, and I think that's it. Lauren, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Actually, Lynn, I think we may have some extra time uh, oh. during the learning community session. So okay. if um, after you've met with your learning communities, if you have extra time, come back into the main room. Maybe you can answer questions then. Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be great.